Hey, you're golden. <laughs> I'm sure of a Let me tell you. <laughs> yeah, of course. Okay. Let's see. Okay. The review for the final exam. It's kind, of, it's kind of long and wordy because I wrote most of the problems from scratch. As if you hadn't read the chapter, you probably muddled through it. Okay. Uh, I thought that would be appropriate uh, because there are so many formulas. And indeed, I have um, published the formula sheet. Not published, I collated the formula sheet that I will be handing out with the test. That, together with the uh, standard normal table, will be given. Okay. And so you might want to look, read through the text to see all the accompanying um, materials. A, B, B, A, B. <laughs> I don't know. Corollary A, B. That's what I'm talking about. Corollary is A. Corollary B theorem, B corollary, whatever that means. He's got so many theorems and corollaries in the chapter. Um, and to keep the one sheet, I kept up with proofs and so on and all, all this stuff. Uh, so you can actually use all those formulas probably on the practice sheet. Uh, just about. And, um, I think the first two problems were is where I'm going to do most of my changing around and and I what I've done is I cheated a little bit in the sense that I said I'm only going to cover the last two chapters, but since there was a lot of moment generating function stuff in chapter six, which we didn't cover that much, I'm kind of asking you to know the, mo the definition of moment generating function, no definition of properties. So maybe I should do an example or something. Calculate a moment generating function, maybe if there's an easy one. Right? Uh, know the properties. What kind of we actually did have an exercise related to that in chapter six. Um, let's see what did we have. We had show. X and Y are, okay, I guess we didn't actually have this one, okay. Um, well, actually, it was very closely related. Show that if X and Y are independent exponential random variables with lambda equals 1, then X over Y follows an F distribution. Yeah, identify the degrees of freedom. Remember that problem? Now, some people did that um, by calculating the density of the quotient by going back to chapter 3 and using the formula for the density of a quotient of independent random variables, plugging in the formulas and coming out with a density and then matching it with the density of an F distribution. That was a very wise thing to do and it wasn't that difficult. And there turned out to be another approach to this problem basically related to the fact that uh, if you check the densities uh, you know that um, what you have is a density of chi squared, which I'm not going to require you to know. So I'll put new degrees of freedom. This is something like, uh, well, see, that's uh, den equals density of gamma. I might be able to remember one half mu over two. Okay. So the lambda is one half, and the alpha is mu over two. And so that comes out to be um, uh, f of u, let's put a u then, let's put this capital U. f of u equals, let's see, how does it work? You go u to the lambda, let's see, lambda minus 1 over gamma of mu, <coughs> therefore, let's see, this is not, this is no minus 1, lambda minus Then I have uh, e to the minus 
That's, okay, so there's a lot to memorize. So you probably won't memorize that, okay? But why should I, ever? Do you remember what the, what the, uh, what the amazing thing about moment generating functions is? This might help you a little bit. The short moment generating function table. Moment generating function table. What's the moment generating function of exponential lambda? So we can do this. This would be expectation e to the t exponential x equals the integral e to the t x. Then I have to put the density of the exponential dot. We still remember that. <laughs> lambda e to the minus x lambda x dx. Okay, it's been a while. This is not like to review day. Okay, zero to infinity then. And then how would I do that integral? I'm not making you memorize these things, it's just, um, uh, yeah, it's just, here's how I do remember it, okay, this is what I'm showing you. Everything is going to go back to exponential, okay, for this whole uh, gamma and chi-square business, is what I'm trying to teach you. Here's the momentary function of the exponential, and you may not mem may have it memorized. Okay. So how would you do it? What do you do to get to, to do this integral? It's just exponential, exponential integral, right? There's not even any x squares or anything hard, right? So you just combine the exponents. Either the now the way I usually do it is I put a minus sign to make sure it's going to be integrable out front. Uh, I'm going to minus sign, and then I put there's an x common, and then in front, let's say it would be lambda minus t then. The lambda goes to the minus sign. But I have to put a minus t here in order to go with this minus sign. Okay? And then I just have lambda dx. Okay? And I just, as long as uh, t is less than lambda, then this is a converted integral. X is the yeah. variable of integration. t is just a fixed parameter. This is the moment generating function parameter. Lambda is the fixed parameter of the exponential distribution. So, so we get lambda over lambda minus t. Lambda over lambda minus t. Okay. Very good. Okay, well sometimes you write it as one over one minus t over lambda. Okay. Very good. Alright, so just by writing it down, I've been doing this calculus course. Okay. <laughs> okay. So that may not memorize, but you should be able, you know, in a moment's notice, you should be able to take 30 seconds and read the line of it, okay? So that's, that's the uh, moment generating function of the exponential. Therefore, now, what you know is that the gamma, you should remember that the gamma is the general, the gamma lambda n is, is the, is basically the sum of n independent exponentials. That's usually how I remember it. Okay, equals some xi, i goes from 1 to n, or xi independent exponential lambda. And the way we prove that actually is that we actually found the moment generating function of the gamma. And so what it, and so how did we prove that? What what is the proof? The proof is that the moment generating function of the exponent of this gamma is the nth power of this thing, okay? MGF of gamma, so I'll just recall how we actually proved it, is lambda over lambda minus t to the nth power 
So how does that prove that? How do, if I know this last statement, how does that prove that gamma is the sum of independent exponential lambdas? Because um, when you functions, like when you add them, they multiply together. Okay, when you add the independent variables, the moment generating functions multiply. That is correct. Adding independent variables. Gives that the MGF of the sum is a product of individual moment generating functions of MGFs of the summits would be, a, I think that is grammatically, almost grammatically correct. <laughs> it is mathematically correct. Okay? So in particular, notice that if um, if you have this memorized, what you have is that uh, if I put new equals to 2, then on the one hand, chi square is gamma 1 half of 1. But that's just, therefore, exponential 1 half. Because when n is 1, you get the exponential case. All right, so actually, a chi square with 2 degrees of freedom is exponential with a parameter 1 half. Okay. So, there's something, you know, that maybe you keep that in the back of your mind for a little while, okay, anyway, in your life. It just is, um, you know, there's something with chi-square and exponential, okay, that's <laughs> why so you kind of remember, oh, it is. And, and somehow gamma got in there. Okay, if you really have it well memorized now, that gamma is actually the key to how that works among generating functions and so on. Why do you go for it? Pretty much this gamma, this gamma one. If you have that all memorized, then you're in great shape. Okay. All right. So that's one generating function. Review. Um, and the application, I guess. And this problem. Let's see. What did I give you here? Let x be a, now. I in the problem number one. Let x be a standard normal random variable. And put y equals x squared. Show that the moment generating function of y is this. Okay, there might be a couple ways to do that. First, you might want to find the density of y equals x squared. That's one possibility. Or another way is just to go with, by direct calculation and find the moment generating function, which is your choice. That's the easiest one. That's what I did. This is the way substitute, you did it. Substitute half for lambda and half for n. Falls right out. Okay, so you're saying if you had this memorized, then you'd yeah, know, right. if you had this fact memorized that I just had over here, you got this. Right? Well, you didn't give us much space, so I figured you had to memorize it. <laughs> okay, you're right. I'm going to give you a whole space. page on the actual exam. <laughs> this is because it's a practice exam. Okay? That's why I didn't give you a lot of space. I think we have your own paper or your own computer or something. So one way is saying, okay, if I if I actually look at this, 1 minus, if I look like any linear community, it's got to have the right, the moment generating function has to equal one at t equal to zero. All right, so I can't have just have any linear expression in here. It has to be a linear expression that's, and then I have a power minus one half. Okay, so that is the form of the moment generating function of a gamma. Okay, because it's a it's it's a linear function. 
function of d to a power, okay, to a negative power. It's actually the way that works. You see, this is a negative power of, this is 1 over 1 minus t over lambda, okay, to the end. And actually, this works for, n does not have to be an integer here, okay? This was true for any positive number n, okay, that the, that the moment generating function of the gamma lambda n is this. That did not depend on, remember, because it was this simplification, it was this way. Okay, when n is an integer, gamma lambda n is the sum of n independent exponentials. But in general, gamma lambda n has this as its moment generating function for any n greater than zero. That was just simply a change of variable, simply a lot like this. Okay? Exponential calculation. So this is this is MGF of gamma. Let's see, the power is a half. It's this is negative one half, so this is a half. And then the lambda, well you may have trouble with that. Okay? You may not know how to figure out what the lambda is. Okay? That would be the only thing. And I guess if you knew that exactly, then lambda, since it's t over lambda there, then that lambda is a half. Okay? So, do you have that memorized over there, Al? The no, I spent about uh, 45 minutes <laughs> looking for it. Okay. <laughs> okay, that's what I thought. <laughs> I wouldn't have done it that way, but... Uh, okay. So then if you knew, if you had your encyclopedic mind, then you would have that information and uh, you would just figure, read off the n and the lambda and you'd be in good shape, okay? So, and then once that's done, then, uh, but then you know that this is, since that's the right one half there, okay, because you could have guessed this, you know you're supposed to take chi square. And since this is one here, the new is one, then you have chi square with one degree of freedom. I told you to make it a chi square one degree. Well, you know it's supposed to be chi square one degree of freedom because you have a standard normal square, right? There's only one of them. There's only one of them. Okay? If I take n01 and I square it, that's chi square with one degree of freedom, right? What's the general definition of a chi square of new degrees of freedom? Uh, the summation of new Squared. Yeah, it would be a z1 squared plus z2 squared plus and so on plus z sub so new squared. Well, these are independent n0, 1. Okay. So I'm kind of reviewing a lot of facts here, which may seem a little scary. But um, this is one way to work the problem is basically to have the tape, you know, some information. That chi square is a gamma, and then you know the moment generating function of all gammas. That's one way. That's one way to work it. Um, I could put a little bit more information if I wanted to give the last pages of this uh, book. They have a little cheat sheet back here too with that distributional information in there. Um, let's see if it's appropriate. Distributions and you have continuous distributions. Well, yeah, I guess actually there it is. I can give you, there it is, in one paragraph. Continuous distributions, normal gamma and chi square, right there on page 82. Maybe I'll throw that on there too, just so you won't get lost. If you're going to read the table and know what that says, I'm happy. Okay? So I'll, I'll throw that in too. That's an extra page. Here's, here's the stuff on chapter 7 that I'm going to put in. Did everybody get one of those? Okay. And then I think I will pay, put pay, this part in continuous distributions from page A2 on the back of the normal probability uh, business. Okay? That way you'll have the, t the encyclopedia, okay? All right. So that's one way to do that problem. There's another way to do it is just go ahead and do by brute force calculation, right? And that is to calculate if I had the expect if I had moment generating function of, of a chi square x squared t, that would be expectation e to the t x squared. Okay, and then I could pull out the stand, the the uh, integral e to the t 
3x squared, and then I have e to the minus x squared over 2 over the square root of 2 pi. So this is the, standard, and the density of the standard normal. So that's, to get uh, problem 1 part a directly, would be to do this integral. How would you do that integral? How do you do all the other integrals in here? In this course. Either by integration by parts or change of variables. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Uh, you can use gamma, gamma, everything. No, you can't use the gamma. Because it's x squared now. Unless you change variables to get to a gamma. Then you, obviously, since we're working with gamma, you can change variables to get to a gamma. Y equals x squared will change you to a gamma density. Mm -hmm. That's one way to do it. Is there another way to do it? Yeah, well, how about combining exponents again? I know it's not an x, it's an x squared. But then you know the family of normal densities too, right? You know the normal density family, because you know you know something like integral e to the minus x squared over 2 sigma squared, like that, dx, OK? Without doing a change of variables minus infinity or infinity, this gives you to the square root of 2 pi sigma, because that's what it has to be. Because that's the right normalization in the bottom to make the, the whole left side one if I had a density. So I get it like that. Now, so if you use that fact, so then, which you probably had memorized, didn't you? <laughs> that's also on page 82, isn't it? Normal. Yeah, there it is. Okay. So, you could use that to, and then put the exponents together. So you get this integral then is uh, e to the minus, I guess I shouldn't have had you do it this way. Everybody's too trying to find Minus x squared. Um, and then I have t minus a half, or t minus t, uh, one half minus t. not divided by, okay, dx minus infinity over infinity. So if I use this little table right here, okay, and then I have a 2 pi, so we're at 2 pi. So if I now take this little table here and said, okay, if I divide it by 2 sigma squared, I know what the answer is. Now I just have to basically say now that my, my, two, uh, that my 2 sigma squared equals 1 over a half minus t to use this table, okay? So that means that uh, sigma squared is equal to, right, is, is uh, 1 over 2, 1 over 1 minus 2t, divided by 2, okay, which is multiplied by the by 2 up here. So that gives you that, therefore, this is, now I have a square root of 2 pi here. So I get 1 over square root of 2 pi, another square root of 2 pi, and then the square root of this, the square root of 1 over 1 minus 2 t. And then I get my answer. Okay? That's my answer that I wanted. This is the square root instead of negative 1 half power. Okay? So there is a way to get out of the bag that way. <laughs> it is kind of special information. I don't think I'm going to be quite as, you know, I'm going to go for a more bottom line of basic thing to see if we get the properties of moment generating functions. Um, beautiful. If you think what you can probably make with yourself. Okay. But I'm going to <laughs> um, ask about moment generating function in part A of problem one. So don't get flustered if you can't get part A of problem one. Um, on to the next one, there'll be an extra credit card. Okay? Um, I'm asking you to do the central limit there and over the definition of a chi square random variable. So I'm going to reword those first two problems a little bit. And then the rest of the problems are going to be very similarly worded, probably going to change the numbers. So.
So which problem would you like to fix? Next. You might have answered the whole thing. You have to work through it yourself. You might want the answers to the problems. Do you want the answers to the problems? Yeah. Okay. There's not, no answers to give because I tell you everything you consider that was a theory problem, right? One, okay, theory. Okay, <laughs> two, and so you had you had two because I gave you the answers, right? Um, the u to the chi square, I have to calculate the following probability that u is bigger than 20, u is bigger than 35. I get um, z equal to the square root of 2. So that you get the answer is 1 minus v of the square root of 2, which is the probability uh, from the table. I don't know exactly where it is. Some of these things I didn't actually work out all the 1 minus. Four balls are placed in an urn, and I'm just giving you the, the, the total population is one, one, two, and four. So what's the mean of that population? The overall mean, the mean is mu equals two, right? Obviously. And what's sigma squared? Sigma squared comes out to be three halves, I believe. This is not stratified. This is just a state straight thing. What I want you to do is find the probability, just probability mass function of the sample mean x bar. Piece of x bar of x. Okay, this is x. Or maybe we should call it little x bar. Little x bar. Okay. <laughs> we didn't use little x bar very much. Okay. What's the probability mass function? Let's see. There are, what are the possible values? The possible values of x bar are 1, 3 halves, 5 halves, 3. So the probability mass function is 1 sixth, 2 sixths, 2 sixths, and 1 sixth. Right. Okay. So it's, it's obvious that uh, this comes out to be equal to. Uh, e of x bar, therefore, comes out to be equal to 2. That's what you're supposed to show. Right. And the variance of x bar comes out to be equal to uh, 1 half. You will see. Okay. From this. Okay. Let's this, this gives this. So this distribution, you have to derive the distribution by taking all possible samples of size 2. I didn't show you what all the samples of size 2 were <laughs> in the population, right? Everybody clear? I had a population which was 1, 1, 2, and 4. That was capital N equals 4. That wasn't so important. Because uh, we're not looking at a stratified case. But, and then I looked at all possible samples of size 2. This is my, my initial urn that I samples of size two, and then I have to construct another urn giving all the samples of size two, which if I do unordered samples, which is all that's necessary here, it would be one, one. Um, that is possible. It's possible. Sample without replacing, right? One, two, uh, one, two, uh, one, four, one, four. It's two ones. Okay? So it looks like that. Or you can do ordered pairs if you want. Because there's two 
ones, one of them was a stylized one if you want. I can make it look like that, okay? Uh, one, one. One, ten. one of these was the one, the other one was a stylized one. Okay, like that. Okay? That shows how all the ones are different marbles. Okay? Okay. Sample of size two. All samples of size two. And so that's how you get this. This is I pretty much solved the problem here. And then you should actually, you can check if you go back to that um, table on page 214, which was this top, the first table on this cheat sheet. Did everybody get one now? Everybody get, did you get the cheat sheet, Jamie? Jamie? Okay. Then actually, you should see what the uh, formula for x, the the variance of x bar is on the third column, first row. It says sigma squared over little n times capital N minus little n over capital N minus 1. Capital N is 4, little n is 2. So that says I should be getting sigma squared over 2 times 4 minus 2 over 4 minus 1, which comes out to be sigma squared over 3. So you, you were supposed to verify that indeed uh, 1 half is 1 third of three halves. <laughs> okay. That was so this is the same problem, problem one from chapter seven. I just asked it again. Okay? On the final exam. Next problem. So there's places you can check your answers using the theory that's on that cheat sheet, okay? Um, a certain housing development contains 8,000 condominium units. The actual fraction P of all the condominiums is unknown. It's a grand example of 400 over 4 blah. So we have P hat is uh, 44 over 400 equals 0.11, okay? 90% confidence interval for PS squared sub P hat, right off the table. Okay, is p hat 1 minus p hat over little n minus 1 times the square root of 1 minus little n over capital N. And this came out very close to, let's see, what does it come out to exactly? I'm going to have to have a calculator to get this exactly because I did not actually write everything down here. Okay. Here it is. If I wrote everything down here. Two, okay, I basically have, um, this comes up very close to 0.15, but um, well, okay. So S of P hat is very close. This this is my 390, this is my 399, and then the final population picture is the point one. This is is roughly point zero one five. Okay, it's not exactly. Okay. Where did the um, square root in the final kind of population correction come from? Uh, I didn't come here. I'm sorry. Yeah, okay, I'm sorry. So S of P hat equals the square root of P hat one minus P hat. This is I'll put it at point one one point eight nine over 399, then I have a square root of 1 minus 400 over 8,000. It's a small effective applied population correction. And this is roughly 0.015. Okay. Now what do you do? And then you have uh, the 90% confidence interval is then uh, 0.11 plus or minus 1.645 times S of P hat. Okay. Now, then part B. Then I assume that uh, 
uh, assume the population parameter P is less or equal to 0.2 pulse. Now, why is that going to be any good? Because the smaller it is, the less sample to me. Yeah, that's okay. true. It's smaller, smaller than, than, therefore, the sigma sub p hat, the actual standard error, equals uh, p 1 minus equals uh, the square root of p 1 minus p over n, okay, times the square root of 1 minus n minus 1 over capital n minus 1, okay, is less than or equal to um, the square root of Point two, because you get smaller at the end. It's, it's bigger in the middle. P equals point five. It's the biggest number here. It was less than equal point two times point eight over n. And I have my square root of one minus n minus one over capital n minus one. Now, for the first part of part B, I say ignore the finite population correction. Okay. And so I want, and I want, um, I want one point nine six sigma p hat to be less than or equal to point oh two. Okay. Want, why well, I just want, let's just say, equal 0.02. So don't get confused with the 0.02 and the, did I say 0.02? So you estimate with P and 0.02? With 95% confidence. Here I had almost within 0.02 with 90% confidence. But I want to up the confidence level and I want to reduce the amount of. Uh, the size of this uh, plus or minus. This plus or minus was about 2.4, or 0.024, or something like that. So I want to reduce to 0.02 with 95% confidence. Okay. And so I'm going to do this, and so I'm going to take, so that's going to give me um, what this should be. So that I'm going to solve, therefore, to 0.2 times 0 0.8 over n equal to 0 0.02 over 1.96. So I have to flip the thing. And so I'm going to get n square root of n over over 0 0.4 because that's when I actually take the square root. That's the square root of 0 0.16, which is 0.4. Okay. When I flip the thing, take the square root equal to 1.96 over 0.02. And so then I can multiply across and get the square root of n equal to 0.4 over 0.02 is 20. Equals 20 times 1.96. And so then I get n is about 40 squared or about 1600. N is roughly 1600. Okay? And it's roughly 1600. Okay? So I have to quadruple the sample size. Now, because 1600, oh, okay, that's one fifth of 8,000, I should bring in the finite population correction. So then I'm going to be able to reduce my sample size a little bit because this is going to actually help me. Okay? So now what do I do? Now I put that number in. Here, okay, as a first approximation, roughly, that's 1 minus a fifth now. So now I recalculate again using the fact that now this is, um, so now sigma, sigma p hat is now uh, less than or equal to um, well, then now be roughly equal to the square root of 0 0.2 times 0 0.8 over um, n times the square root of, I'll just put that in, 1 minus a fifth, okay? 1,600 over 8,000. Okay? And I'll recalculate it again, okay, over here. And I'll get a smaller n, okay? And then you can do it a couple more times. Just iterate that, but it's not necessary. Just do it once more, okay? You get a little bit of savings, okay? You understand know, so what I'm doing? I'm trying to solve a more complicated equation. So this equal to 0.02 over 1.96, but not actually going through the algebra. I don't want to go through the algebra and solve any equations. I want to do it with an iterative approach. Or just ignore this, this term. 
first, then get your and. You say, okay, then I better put this term in. It's not trivial anymore. Okay? Okay. And go through again. Solve. So I want you to be less fine. I don't know. Maybe another twenty percent savings, is that what it is? Uh no. And sigma would only be for see I'll, I'll I'll make sigma will be less by about ten percent. Okay. So how will that'll be how will that correlate to a savings on the end? consists of n equals five pairs as follows. First, I told you what all the population parameters are, so you can verify those by hand. Okay? And problem number five. So you should verify that mu x equals two, mu y equals three, so the variance of x is four fifths, and the population variance of y is two, and the population covariance is one. You should go through and verify all those facts. Uh, before you know, just to recall how those things go. Uh, actually, I said show, do it, okay? In this problem, right? So show all of them. That's before you do anything. How do you show sigma x y equals one? Sum of x minus u x. I do summation x y minus uh, divided by five over. X mu y, that would be the easiest way to do it after that get Okay. So this would be, I just multiply the, the numbers in each parentheses together, so this would be 1 times 1 plus 1 times 2 plus 2 times 4 plus 3 times 3 plus 3 times 5 minus, I've already verified mu x is 2 and mu y is 3. Okay. So this would give 1 plus 3, 1 plus 2 is 3, plus 8 is 11, 20, 20 and 15 is 35 divided by 5 is 7 minus 6 is 1. Okay, so I didn't, I didn't write down with the correlation. You're going to have to know that if you if you want to use the formulas in the book, you're going to probably have to know that sigma x y is equal to rho sigma x sigma y. Okay, that's a fact. If you were going to use one of the uh, formulas in the book, because I think they put them in terms of rho and so on. Okay, not the sigma x y. So I could actually calculate the population correlation between x and y as well. Let's see. If I can. Okay. So now, right, we take a simple random sample of the pairs of size 3. Show all 5 choose 3, that is 10 possible random samples explicitly. Oh boy. That's a lot of fun, isn't it? Okay. Can everyone do that? Um. <laughs> So, 1, 1, 1, 2, 2, 4, 1, 1, 1, 2, 3, 3, get to your pen, 1, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5. How am I doing this? I, I didn't write down the actual pairs themselves. We should write down the pairs themselves. They were 1, 1, 1, 2, 2, 4, 3, 3, 3, 5. Here's the actual population of pairs. This is the population. 
right? So I'm doing one, 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 two, two, four, one, 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 two, three, three. I'm just taking the first two and then one of the others, my first three cases, right? <laughs> and that's it, okay? And now, now I start with the, now I skip one, right? So I'm going to do one, one. I know this is a pain. One, one, two, four. Okay, those are the same. Then what I have to calculate is the ratio estimator for each of these. The ratio estimator of mu sub y. What if mu sub y was equal to 3, right? This is equal to 3. Now I want the ratio estimator for each of these samples. What is the ratio estimator? So y bar sub r equals mu x times y bar over x bar. U x is 2. So this comes out to be 2 times y bar over x bar. I think the ratio estimator, was that, was that specified over here? I never actually wrote down what it was. And this cheat sheet, you actually have to know what the ratio estimator is. Okay. So what is the ratio estimator in each of these cases? So this is 2 times 7 fourths, I believe. Y bar, just add up the y's. 1, 2, and 4 is 7. Add up the x's. 2, 1, and 1. Okay? Let's see if I get it right. 2 times 1, 2, 3 is 6 fifths. Okay? So this is y bar sub r. And I'm going to get the distribution then for y bar sub r, the exact distribution of y bar sub r. Factor one is eight, so eight fifths, two times eight fifths, two times ten sixths, three four. Uh huh. Let's just skip something. Four and threes. Five four. Uh, I did it in the order here. Wait a second. Three three one one two four three three. I did make a mistake here, it looks like. That's 8 6. So I made a mistake here. I kept doing this too fast. Okay, 1, 1, 2, 4. This, this is 10 6. 2 times 10 6. And 9 7. Okay, so you see there's a bit of work here, numerical work. This comes out to be uh, y bar is bar is 2 times. Um, well, maybe you like that. Nine six. <laughs> okay. One one two two four three three. Yeah, I made a mistake there too. Okay. Then I get two times eleven sevens. Is that right? How come it's six? It should be six again. Three two and one six. Then I have two times. Ten sevens. That one looks right. 
2 times 12 eighths. 5, 3, 4 is 12, divided by 8. So now I actually have all those things, and I actually have to calculate the y bar sub r. Okay? So I have to add all those things up and divide by 10. Okay, to add up all these numbers and divide by 10. I'm not going to be able to do that for you. You're going to have to do that by hand. Okay? It kept, the bias is small, but I made a mistake, so I don't know exactly what it is now. Um, now, if I only did, I give you a hint, if I only did a sample of size 2, the bias is not so small. Okay? So in other words, what you're going to get is you're going to get the actual bias, 2 times 7 fourths plus 2 times 6 fifths. I have to add all these numbers up, plus dot, 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 plus 2 times 12 eighths, and divide by 10, however many samples I have there. And this is the actual EY bar sub R. And so this is not equal to 3. Okay? because y bar sub r is biased. But if the actual bias is then the bias is equal to this thing. Minus 3. Okay. And then that's not actually going to be equal to the formula for the approximate biases on this sheet either. Okay. <laughs> so that's why I'm sort of having you do, you know, see if you understand the theory. There's an approximate bias given by corollary b here in the middle of the page. And because little n is very small, and capital N is also pretty small, that approximate bias formula may not work at all. Okay? Gives you kind of a ballpark. But what you're going to find here is the bias. And then what else do I ask for? I also ask for the variance of y bar sub r, which would be. You would have to get the uh, expectation right, so that would be equal to the expectation of the square. You would square all these numbers, and it's a fact of the number you got here, dy bar square squared, equals 2 times 7 fourths squared plus 2 times 6 fifths squared. I might as well not record what I wrote down because I made some mistakes when I did this calculation here. Put some of the wrong potions here. Not impossible. It's not impossible. As long as you know what you're doing, and I can take off for numerical errors at this point in the game. Divided by, show me all your work, divided by 10 minus EY bar sub r squared. And then you're going to get a number. And that's going to be much closer to the approximate variance given by those formulas. The bias formula doesn't work so well when this little n is small, but the variance formula is working all right. So you might want to compare that. Okay? And then what I ask for is the MSE of y bar sub r. What that is, is how close is this the actual, which is expectation of y bar sub r minus 3, the quantity squared. Okay? This is the mu sub y, right? Uh, what that is, is that's equal to the square of the bias plus the variance of y bar sub r. So you just calculate the variance and add the square of the bias, and that's your MSE. Now, what's the MSE of, if you didn't use this ratio estimator to estimate? Just y bar? Y bar. Yeah, what's the MSE of, of, variance of y? y bar? That's because the bias is zero in this case. This is also bias squared plus the variance of y bar, okay? The bias in this case is zero. You should know from theory, you can check it correctly if you want to. You can also calculate y bar for each of these, okay? So, and you can either calculate the variance of y bar by going through this calculation again and just ignoring the x's, right? <coughs> just do the y bar, which is 4 plus 2 plus 1 divided by 3, 7 thirds, right? You can get the variance of y bar and everything to find more calculation, or you can use theory. If you're running out of time, you should probably use theory. Variance of y bar is sigma squared over n, sigma y squared over n, 
And then there's a finite population correction, right? 1 minus little n minus 1 over capital n minus 1. Okay. Just on the sheet as well. Okay? Table at the top. So then you can compare these two things, which is actually the better one. So it's kind of a long-winded problem. Uh, the reason I went to sample size 3, by the way, for this take it home is because uh, when we took the sample size 2, the bias was really big. Okay. But uh, it does make it kind of long. Samples of size 3 are too much, probably, for an academic exam. But it's up to you. Maybe sample size 4. That's small again. <laughs> Sample of size 4, because uh, then you're only leaving out one, right? So there's only a few samples of size 4. <laughs> there's only one sample of size 5. So uh, sample of size 3 is the worst. Well, not that bad. Sample of size 2 is just as bad in terms of how many things you have to write down. But in terms of the calculation of y bar square, this is a little bit worse. You have sums of three things. Oh, my God. Again, you already had to write all those three things down. So there's a lot of writing. Okay. All right, last problem. Is everybody following? I just want you to get your hands dirty. And then, and hopefully I've generated enough dirt by the time you make the final sample. <laughs> okay. Um, Last problem has to do with the stratify estimator. And so number six has to do with um, what are the answers? Just looking for the answers, right? We're looking for the answers. So we're looking at uh, what I gave you was that W high. This is very much like the problem you had in your last problem, your homework. W low was 0.75. In this problem. And in this problem, I assume the total sample size is 100. N, L, and N, H are the subsample sizes. Some, some populations are sample sizes for the subpopulation. And then, uh, let's see. And then I have the stratified estimator, x bar sub s equals 0.75 x bar low plus 0.25 times x bar high. Okay? And then what is the expectation of x bar sub s? That comes up to be 0.75 times mu L plus 0.25 times mu H, where those are the actual I don't think I actually introduced mu L and mu H in this problem, but those are the subpopulation means, which is equal to the overall population. Did anybody do the extra credit problem? Uh, number 57, a couple people did. What, what am I talking about there? If I look at problem 57, Make sure everybody knows what the subpopulation means are and so on. If you did the extra credit problem number 57, you would be maybe in a little bit better shape. But here, in, the sub, in problem 57, you might want to look at that just a little bit, even do the problem. You had two subpopulations. One, they were one, I'm going to put in curly brackets because these are populations, not samples. Okay? One, two, two, and four, eight. So you took the, exactly the situation of problem number one of the text, and you broke it into two pieces, right? So what were the, so here, capital W1 was three-fifths, and capital W2 was two-fifths. And mu sub one was equal to five-thirds, and mu sub two was equal to six Period. Okay? And then what's mu? Mu, mu, you know, from the from your problem number one, where you just added all these numbers up, right? Five and twelve is seventeen divided by five. 
the mu is 17 fifths. But indeed, that is equal to, if I multiply this one by 3 fifths, and this one by 2 fifths, and add, which is the same thing as 3 fifths times 5 thirds plus 2 fifths times 6. Check that out. Okay, which is 1 plus 12 fifths, which is 17 fifths. So, what you have is that, I mean, that, that's all that really needs to know to prove this last identity. Uh, you just go through the definitions of mu L mu H R in terms of sum over the values in the populations divided by the number of things in the population. Plug in your definitions for the W's, it falls out. Here I'm just demonstrating numerically that it's working out, right? So this 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 was the, I think the first thing they showed in the book in this chapter, okay? Which is like this the W1 mu1 plus W2 mu2 is equal to mu. So, first answer is the mean of x bar s is mu, and that's independent of little nh and little nl. In this problem, I'm going to be varying the subsample with the sample size for the subpopulations, right? I'm going to be varying how many samples I actually pick. But because this is unbiased, independent of nl, all right? Independent of how many samples I take, that's unbiased for mu sub l. E x bar sub l equals mu sub l. E x bar sub h equals mu sub h. Is everybody following that? That's independent of the actual allocations of sample sizes. See, if I'm going to take a sample size 2, let's say, I can take 2 here and none here. I could actually, of course, that's not easily legal. <laughs> take zero samples. Okay? But still, it could. All right? And, uh, or I can take 2 from here and none from there. All right? Or I can take 1 from here. Anyway, no matter how I do it, this thing comes out to equal that. All right? So the actual, and the sampling has nothing to do with these Ws, the actual samples. All right? These Ws are just the subpopulation. Those are, those are the structure, strata, are three-fifths of the total number of population values and two-fifths of the total number of population values. So try to keep that straight. The Ws are structural. The mu's are structural, okay? Mu is structural. The little n's are not, okay? That's your choice, all right? And you get various properties, but this is always, this x bar sub s is unbiased, independent of those choices, okay? All right, so what else are we gonna do here? It says, now go ahead and calculate the variance in each of these cases. So I actually answered uh, the mean for all cases, all right? E x bar x is always mu. In fact, I think I, I left that theorem off this cheat sheet, by the way. That was another theorem. <laughs> it said theorem B, the variance of x bar s, but I didn't put theorem A, the mean of x bar s. Okay. Now I go ahead and calculate the variance in each of these other cases. The variance, let's see if I wrote it down. I think I wrote it down, so I can give you the answers to number six. Okay. Variance of, so A, the variance of X bar S where I had 15 each, well, okay, that's easier to write down. Because I'm going to do, okay, sigma low was sigma, right? Sigma squared over 50, that's 1 minus 49 over, uh, see how many? I have 1,000 things? 1,000 items? Okay. So this is right here, hang on. Plus 4 sigma squared over 50. One minus forty-nine. So 
of x amount to be equal to um, sigma squared. Part B, what was the variance of x bar s if I made a uh, proportional allocation? Now, there is a formula for that. Ignore finite population correction. And the cheat sheet, okay, in the very bottom, says the variance of x bar sp. So ignoring finite population correction. So let's just say if for part B, the variance, because what I have here is if it's 75, 25, that is the proportional allocation, right? <coughs> X bar S P is equal to, well, if I just did it directly, sigma squared over 75 times 1 minus 74 over 990 plus 4 sigma squared over 25 times 1 minus 24 over 999. Okay, this is exact variance. And ignoring FBC, what would it come down to? It would come out sigma squared over 75 plus 4 sigma squared over 25. Okay. Or also by the formula on page on the cheat sheet, equal to 1 over 100 times, let's see, it was WL sigma L squared, right? It was times 0.75 times sigma squared plus 0.25 times 2 sigma 1 squared. Okay? Either way, it should come out, let's see if they do come out to C. Okay? If I put a common denominator of 75, Way. Let's see. 0.75, and this is 1. 1.75 over 100 sigma squared. Let's see if it comes out here. Uh, let me get it fixed. If it's not right, this has got to be right. Okay. You want your point seven five. You want to switch the point seven five to point two five. Did I have it wrong? <coughs> the wrong places? Well, clearly I had N L you have seventy five in the denominator, it's not gonna equal something with seventy five in the denominator. 
I had NL is 75 and NH is 25. The higher standard deviation was, was NH. So this is correct, right? Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I made a mistake. This is a mistake. I forgot my finite part. I forgot my. Um, this is all. Both of these were a mistake. I forgot my my W squared. This is W squared is 0.75 squared. Okay. Yeah, this happened on the homework too, and I made the same errors that you made. Okay. <laughs> Don't forget your W squares. I'm glad I went through this. Otherwise, you're going to make an error. Okay? This was 0.75 squared, and this is 0.25 squared. Okay? So that's where the hundreds come from. So this comes out sigma squared over 100. Uh, actually, times 0.75 over 100. And this one comes out um, 4 sigma squared times. This is correct. Um, this this bottom line, the theorem, theorem, theorem B is safer. <laughs> okay, yeah, proportional sampling, because then you don't make this mistake. <coughs> but for part A, I really needed this this formula. I need to put in the W squares. Okay, and so this is the one I wrote down before was incorrect. Okay, so this comes out sigma squared over. 50 times 1 minus 49 over 999 times 0.75 squared plus 0.25 squared times 4. Yeah. Okay. Which is, let's see, what is that? 0.0625 times 4, well, that's, that's 0.25, and it's about 0.5, so this comes out to be about 0.7576, so this is um, roughly um, sampling was worse than it's 50-50. Okay. So what was the optimal sampling size? Well, how did you do the optimal thing? Ignore your finite population correction. Optimal, you take N so L equals WL sigma L divided by the summation of the WL sigma L. I don't know what the exact exact sigmas are here, but it won't matter. This comes out to be 0.7, so N so O comes out to be 0.75 times sigma over 0.75 times sigma plus 0.25 times 2 sigma equals 75 over 125 times N. N was specified as a total sample size. N equals uh, three fifths N equals sixty. Okay, so we'll take sixty samples. From the low stratum, forty samples from the high stratum. I forgot my N. I didn't put this formula on the cheat sheet. So no, it's on the cheat sheet. What is it on the cheat sheet? This formula is not on the cheat sheet. It gives you what the variance should be if you do optimal, ignoring FBC. This is ignoring FBC. And then if I actually go ahead and calculate then the variance of X bar stratified optimal is approximately, ignoring FBC here, then 
uh, sigma bar squared divided by 100. Okay, where sigma bar is simply equal to that. This point is this is this 1.25 sigma. If I square 1.25, what do I get? Actually, I get something bigger than this, so this must be wrong. Okay, maybe it isn't wrong, because this I put the finite population corrections in. Okay. Yeah, I put the finite population correction in to get this, and so I get that this is um, uh, 1.25 squared over 100 times sigma squared. That looks a little bit bigger than this 0.015. All right, or 0.014. Because 1.2 squared is 1.44. Okay. So I, you know, so this one competes pretty closely to the actual optimum. Okay. But if, but if I actually put the finite population correction in here, I believe this one might be a little bit smaller. But since we ignore finite population correction, I don't know. See, this might not actually be the optimal 60 40. The optimal might be 50, closer to 50 50 because of the finite population correction. So it's kind of a curious little problem. I'm actually making it, if you actually get down and actually write everything down, the <coughs> finite population correction, uh, 50 50 may be closer to the right answer. To get the optimal allocation. All right. You wouldn't want to search all day and do these calculations. Forever. You can do it with a computer. Now, what will be allowed? I think just your basic uh, statistical calculator, scientific calculator. Uh, in order to calculate standard deviation, you want to do some of 10 squares, or numbers, or something like that. Okay? Are you set? It's going to be kind of long in terms of all the computations. Then there'll be an extra credit problem where I think I'm just going to ask you, to, I said I was always going to ask you to run multiplier stuff. Yes, I do. Yeah. Maybe people that just came in a little bit late. Yes, uh, I just gave this one sheet and then there was the normal table, everybody knows what that looks like, right? And then I'm going to give you that one sheet um, from the back of the book. All right? And that'll be it. Um, so it's kind of selective open book, <laughs> okay? Um, and if you want to see your homework averages and all that stuff the way I've got it, you know, please see me in my office. I'll be in my office uh, today and next week, I guess. Um, well, do you need an extra office hour? Please make an appointment if you need an extra office hour, okay? And I'll make an appointment. I'll have to be in my office after the exam next week, too. And I'll be in again one other day next week in case you want to talk. Okay? Good, that's it. Thank you.